honor and adoration be to God Almighty for his sustenance, love, and protection once again. Highly esteemed listeners, welcome to the Oracles of God Radio Broadcast, a biblical program that is run and sponsored by the Churches of Christ, which come your way every Wednesday on Radio Universe 105.7 FM. Shall we commit ourselves to the Almighty God? To thee we ascribe praise, glory, and honor, O God Almighty, for your wonderful blessings, love, and compassion towards your children. Once again, we are enjoying your benevolence acts by adding us to the land of the living. We know it's not because of our righteousness, for we are sinners before you, and even our righteousness without Christ is as filthy rags before you. We thank you for sending your son Jesus Christ as a ransom for many, that our robes are cleansed in his precious blood. We ask for forgiveness of sins once again, that you continue to cleanse us in the precious blood of Jesus, that we will be blameless before you continually. Once again, we thank you for this opportunity you are according us, O oh Lord, that we listen to your priceless oracles, that will be able to build us up in this world and the world to come. We thank you as you speak through us, that you grant us hearts of understanding, that will be able to under preach and understand your word, and your audience will also benefit immensely and for the purpose for which you are sending this message. Thank you for the lives of the staff of the Radio Universe, especially we ask that you continue to grant your wisdom and ability to the technicians as they transmit your oracles and treated to your audience. Begin and end successfully with us, in the name above all names, Jesus Christ our Lord, do we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Highly esteemed listeners, we are continuing with our series of lessons we are drawing from the theme, Dead Preachers Preach Unto Us. Dead Preachers Preach Unto Us. We have looked at lots of the Old Testament prophets and how God dealt with them with his people and how they speak to us today. We once again reiterate that the purpose of these lessons is to draw lessons from them, apply to our daily lives, as well as understand who a prophet was and how God used the prophets and their main work was to preach, was to preach the word of God, not to perform miracles, not to tell about the things that were to come, they were to preach the word of God. And so we look at their preaching and what God has for us. So far we've come to the last week, we began looking at Prophet Habakkuk. Prophet Habakkuk. And as a reminder or a summary or recap quickly, we did say that he was a prophet of Judah. Habakkuk was a prophet of Judah and his name Habakkuk means love's embrace loves embrace or he who embraces we did say that he was possibly a levite in jerusalem and we he began preaching um around the rise of the babylonian empire possibly at the beginning of the empire he was contemporary with the prophets jeremiah halda and zephaniah and thus ministered the word of God during the reigns of kings Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim between 612 to 605 BC. The same with this next, last week we also looked at the historical background that gave uh, rise to this prophet prophesying or doing the work of prophecy. Um, at the time Habakkuk ministered the word of God, we said the temple was still standing. And if you looked at the time of the Babylonian Empire, the empire rose to prominence as it defeated the Assyrians of 612 BC and the Egyptians at the Battle of Katamish in 605 BC. We also said that at the time of Habakkuk's ministry, there was wickedness that he mentioned in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 4, and it's probably a reference to the Babylonians. Why? The reason we gave from the scriptures was that the northern kingdom of Israel had already fallen. And because of the digression of the southern kingdom also, 
into the same moral degradation and social injustices Hawakuku warns of the Babylonians who will eventually terminate the independent theocracy of the Sandin Kingdom. This eventually took place in 586 BC and ended forever the presence of Israel in Palestine as an autonomous free state. But this is where the problem was. The problem that Habakkuk faced and which has become a theological discussion was simply this. Why does the righteous suffer? Why does the righteous suffer? And it appears the wicked rather rejoices. And that is the main conflict that faced Habakkuk and many other people, even today. One, that we said that the first difficulty that Habakkuk had was even among God's people, the southern kingdom of Israel called Judah. Because during that period, they had addressed so much to sin, so wicked, that even the few righteous among them were suffering. And Habakkuk asked the question, he asked God, why do you keep quiet? Why even in, the, in Judah, the wicked were rejoicing why there was no help for the righteous? Then God replied, that well, I am going to punish them. So Habakkuk was quick to find out how he was going to bring justice. And do you know what? Last week we learned that God answered that he was going to bring the Babylonians to punish the, the Israelites the, of Judah. Then Habakkuk became alarmed. He was more confused. Because first, there was this wickedness and the righteous suffering in Judah. And he was asked, calling for justice. And God said, well, I'm going to do this. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. I am going to do, bring justice. And what is the justice he was going to bring? He was going to bring a Gentile nation that knew not God to punish his people, the wicked people. In fact, when Habakkuk realized that, he admitted that even though the wickedness of the, his people Judah even was better than even the righteousness of the Babylonians. And so he became more confused. Why do you look on those who did treacherously, he asked God, and hold your tongue when the wicked divorce the one who is more righteous than he? In Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. And so the plot is set for what will be the basis, foundation for discussion for years, millions of years up to now, why does the righteous suffer? We did say that Habakkuk had a difficult time understanding why God will use the unrighteous to punish his people who were more righteous than those who will bring judgment upon them. But Habakkuk needed to be patient, we said. God will eventually bring the proud conquerors, the Chaldeans, also into judgment for their mistreatment of his people. Oh, God's way fast finding out indeed. The sinlessness. Though Habakkuk is perplexed concerning the work of God among his apostate people, we did say that the proxy judgment of the Chaldeans who will bring God judgment on his people, he defined the judgment of God in a poetic feel funny. The appearance of God, that justice will be done. And thus Habakkuk concludes the book by giving his allegiance to God regardless of his inability to understand all that God does in his relation with his people. In reference to the work of God among those of the world, we did say that the necessity that believers must trust in him. And we began looking at the very important lessons that Habakkuk still preaches to us today. We looked at the lesson number one. And the lesson number one was, that the suffering of the righteous affirms the justice of God. The suffering of the righteous affirms the justice of God. We mentioned Job, that Job, just as Habakkuk, presented what to many unbelievers is the primary arguments against the existence of the God in which the Christian beliefs. We said that even the atheist based his argument on this, that the Christians claimed that they are God, there is God, 
and that God is all powerful and all benevolent, then the atheist thinks that if that is the case, then that God should be able to deliver his people from the wicked. Then that human develops. And if we look out in the world and we realize that the righteous suffer in the midst of wickedness, why it appears the wicked continues to prosper, then they conclude that there is no God. Why? Because if this God is all powerful as the Christians claim, then he should be able to deliver. And if he is all benevolent, then he should be willing to deliver. God should be both able and willing to deliver the righteous from the wicked. But if this is not what is happening according to the atheist, then it is either God is able but he will not and therefore defeats the characteristics of his benevolence or he is willing but he is not able defeating his omnipotency or neither is he able nor willing and therefore is neither powerful nor benevolent. Therefore they conclude that there is no God. Because there won't be any God who will lack these possibilities. This is restlessness. This argument is raised even by people of God as we looked back in scripture, like Elijah, wondering why the woman of Zarephath, that is Sojourn with, son should die. And he said, God, why should you kill the son? And so this keeps on going and going on about the justice of God. The stimulusness. And so last week we tried to look at how the atheist must also answer certain questions. Yes, if the atheist is asking the question, why is evil around in the world where God is supposed to be benevolent and omnipotent? That is the question. Then the atheist also needs to answer the question we raised. That why is it that there is good existing in a totally material world? Because the atheist believes that the world is all matter in motion. So the question comes, where comes good in the world? If the world is all matter and motion, where there is some goodness that they admit that there is? And if there is goodness in matter, then there is really God who exists? The serious listener. Yes, we admit that the believer must answer the question as to why evil exists in a world that was created by a benevolent God. But the atheist must also answer the question why there is good in a totally material world, as they claim. We also learned last week that we must confess the limits of our knowledge and understanding. God is God. And therefore, there are certain things we may not be able to understand, especially as he has promised that all things work together for God, for those who love God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we remember that it's all things, and all things includes what are distasteful, so far the flesh is concerned. All things imply certain things that the world may claim evil. All things work together for God, for those who love God. And those all things we may not understand. If we will be able to understand all that God does in the lives of his people, then we will be God ourselves. We have to be God ourselves to understand how he works. In fact, a lot of people have created God in their own image. And they've kept God in a certain hole. In such a way that they think that that is how God is. We use our minds to fathom God and try to understand and be happy that God is like this. And once we do that, we have created God in our own image. In fact, no one will be able to know exactly who God is and how he is. He loves us and shows glimpses of who he is and how he works. And that is enough for us. Sometimes we think that we want to understand exactly everything but we have to wait until we are God. And we are not God. 
and therefore we should be content and also be patient just as Habakkuk needed to do. Why does the righteous suffer? Listen, listen, listen. Again, we learned that the believer must determine that which is actually good or evil. Because what is normally referred to as God, in the world when we talk of goodness, we are talking about free of pain. Then we describe that as good. But there is an origin of goodness from God. There is absolute goodness. There is absolute truth that the Bible defines. Goodness is not what one thinks it is. Pain is not always evil. Neither is happiness always goodness. And this is something we need to understand. Goodness is goodness as long as God says it is. And pain is evil as long as God says it is. This is the absoluteness of life. We live in a world that people think that happiness is, uh, is all enjoyment. It doesn't matter if you, how you get it. You are okay and so you are blessed. When people are suffering, they just claim that person is evil. And so all of us, we have charlatans and people claiming establishing churches, establishing businesses in the name of churches, and claiming that anyone who is suffering is from the devil. And therefore, they have to come for deliverance. They will tell the person because of some sin he has committed or the mother has committed or something. Not knowing that goodness is not always happiness. We need to understand the differences between what we call evil and goodness. And so, when a righteous suffer, as Job did some time ago, it doesn't mean that he had sinned. When a righteous suffer, as Habakkuk portrayed this complex, difficult plot, for us to understand that God is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient. And it works beyond our imagination. All that we need to do is to obey him and humble ourselves before him. Pain does not always indicate that something is evil. Our body expresses pain in order to protect itself. It is sin, not suffering, that is the only real evil. It is obedience to God, not fleshly pleasure. That is the only real God. However, rebellion against God brings all sorts of evil and suffering into our lives. According to Galatians 6 verse 7, we therefore conclude, therefore, that all suffering is evil is false. We cannot conclude that all suffering is evil. We cannot attribute to God the result of the consequences we suffer when we violate his principle within the environment we live also. Distinguished listeners, this is what we discussed last week. And we continue by saying that we are free moral agents. And so it was very important that God placed us in an environment that allowed choices to be made. God is love. And therefore, he wanted his people to show his love to people who also say, Oh God, I love you too. For one to say, God, I love you too, he should be free to make a choice of evil from evil and goodness. And so that is why evil is on this world. That the righteous will look at the wonders of God, the beauty of his creation, his goodness, and say, oh God, I love you too. Now you imagine if there was no evil here, how would you say that the person has come out of his free will to say, I love you too? And how would God have also be happy with this? How would God have said, well done, my brother, my sister, for choosing among uh, the two and saying you love me too? If all that is around was goodness, and no evil, then how would thank you even be meaningful? Thank you could never have been meaningful. Well done, my servant, you have done in, what you have done in this little things. How will it have been meaningful? Knowing that everything already was already good. The same as We need to be God to understand him. Suffering that are happening unto us 
may not necessarily be because we have sinned or because God is not listening to us, but because it is either somebody is causing unnecessary injustices or we have caused unnecessary injustices and God is using it to protect us, to strengthen our faith, to let us develop from stages to stages. Oh, what a wonderful God. His ways really past finding out. The selflessness. Today we will continue and try to end with Habakkuk with lesson number two. Lesson number two. And the lesson number two that Habakkuk preaches to us today is that the just will live by faith. The just will live by faith. The stimulusness. Because Habakkuk concluded that God had all things under control, though he did not understand the teleology of God's plan, he was willing to live by faith. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, Habakkuk 2, 4, this is what Habakkuk said, quote, but the just will live by his faith. But the just will live by his faith, unquote. Habakkuk 2, 4 is an incredibly important statement simply because of the context in which it is quoted in the New Testament. The same listeners, it is a statement that expresses the very foundation upon which the believer has a relationship with God. In the book of Romans, Paul argues against the legalistic Jewish brethren who would impose on the disciples of Jesus the necessity of being justified before God by law keeping. Paul comes to the following conclusion. After arguing his case against meritorial justification by works of law. And I quote, in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, Romans 11, 6, it reads, And if by grace, then it, that salvation, is no more by works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it is by works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work, unquote. The seriousness, Paul's conclusion concerning self-justification was clear. By works of law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Romans 3, 20. Paul's arguments in Romans that we are saved by faith through grace brought his readers to the conclusion of Habakkuk 2, 4, where he said, For in it, the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just will live by faith. The just will live by faith. Romans 1, 17. And this faith is the gospel, for in it is the righteousness of God revealed. The just will live by faith. The sinlessness. It is God who determines what we should believe. It is God who determines what is faith. And when we believe that, we are saved by that. It is not by in our own way to determine goodness, faith, righteousness, and salvation. This is a principal lesson that Habakkuk is teaching us today. In Galatians, Paul is also arguing against the same legal theology that was promoted by Sammy Rome. Paul's aggressiveness in the book of Galatians inferred that Christianity was in danger of losing its identity if the Judaizing teachers of the area had their way by enforcing legal obedience to law as a means by which one is justified before God. The seriousness. So Paul was direct when he approached Peter at a time when Peter manifested in his behavior that which was contrary to the grace of the gospel. And so we read from Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Galatians 2, 16, it reads, Knowing that a man is not justified by works of law, 
but by the faith of Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by works of law. For by works of law, no flesh will be justified." Unquote. Distinguished listeners, in the context of this statement against legal justification, Paul quoted Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Habakkuk 2 4, he quoted it in Galatians 3 11. Galatians 3 when he said, But that no one is justified by law in the sight of God is evident, for the just will live by faith. Unquote. The same listeners. In Hebrews, some who had been Christian for several years were intimidated into returning to the Sinai law that was given to Israel. Though the Roman and Galatian disciples were not moving away from Christ in this manner, they were imposing a system of law keeping on the disciples that were contrary to the grace of the gospel. Just as we have today, you hear people telling you, yes, we have to go back and take the Old Testament law and add Christ to it. Obey all the Old Testament law and even they have separated some and they observe the Sabbath, do that, do that, do that and add the grace of Christ to it. This was what the Judaism teachers were teaching and the Holy Spirit used Paul to stop them that no, it is either by grace or by works. Though the Roman and Galatian disciples were not doing exactly the Old Testament way, they were also bringing a system of law keeping and any system of law keeping, thinking what is saved through that law keeping is a deception. The Hebrew Christians were thinking about abandoning Christ for the Levitical priesthood of the Sinai law. So again, in the same context of legal justification that Paul addressed in both the Roman and Galatian letters, the Hebrew writer quoted Habakkuk 2.4, Now the just will live by faith. But if any man draws back to law, my soul will have no pleasure in him. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38. Hebrews 10 38. So the Hebrew writer concluded his arguments against drawing back to justification by law skipping by stating in Hebrews 10 39. Hebrews 10 39 and I quote, But we are not of those who draw back to destruction, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul, unquote. Anywhere you find drawing back, drawing back, drawing back in this context, it was a drawing back to the Old Testament law and its precepts. It's a drawing back to keeping either parts or all of the Old Testament law. Unfortunately, no one could even keep all the Old Testament law. And they were selecting the one that pleased them. And Paul used the term draw back, that God will have no pleasure in those who draw back the drawing back was going back to the Old Testament law. As we have today, people are separately picking the one that they love. Things like tithing in the Old Testament law. Things like Sabbath keeping in the Old Testament law. Things like certain things that were the Old Testament law that suits people today. They claim and hold on to it. No matter how they are taught, even the scriptures or the New Testament, they still hold on to it because of their selfish aim of gaining something. Others are ignorant following such leaders. And this is a warning as Habakkuk preaches unto us. The just shall live by faith. And faith at any point in time is what God determines at any point in time. Distinguished listeners, Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 reveals that salvation has always been based on faith and grace, not by law. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 is a New Testament passage, but the principle has always been true since the creation of Adam, the first free moral person. For by grace you are saved through faith, and are not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. From the beginning of time, salvation could never be of ourselves. All have sinned, according to Romans chapter 3 verse 23, and the wages of sin is separation from God, and that's death, according to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And because we sin, we have no atonement for sin that originates from within ourselves. 
We cannot offer God deeds for our imperfect obedience. The offer of good deeds in atonement for law breaking has led to all sorts of all evil among religionists, which evil prevailed throughout the dark ages of humanity. Men offered money in order to have the right to sin. Such was called the sale of indulgences, meaning that one could indulge in sin if money were paid to the church. Similar beliefs are often seated in the minds of many religionists today who believe that their salvation is based on an equal arm scale system of salvation. In other words, one sins of the day can be atoned for tomorrow by being a better person tomorrow than today. That is unfortunate. The single sisters. Habakkuk wanted Israel to understand that God's creation of the remnant of Israel was based on grace. Those nations that God used to judge Israel were terminated. They will no longer exist in the world. And though Israel was given so much, but gave up for sin all her advantages, she will still survive as a remnant. This is the grace of God being played out in history. If God had handed out to them that which they deserved, then there would have been no remnant to receive God's grace into the world through the cross. The existence of the remnant is a manifestation of the grace of God. Instead of rightful national extinction, there was undeserved and unmerited salvation from national extinction. It was because of grace that grace was revealed. Hallelujah. It is in this grace we are today. It is in this grace we live today. It is this grace that we are being called upon into today. That we will not be able to satisfy God by our own righteousness. Never. The righteousness of God has therefore been revealed unto us. And through grace at the time that we are sinners, God sent his son Jesus Christ to die for you and my sins, that when we come unto him free morally, then it works on us as if we've never sinned before. Hallelujah. Why do we therefore waste time? Why do we therefore linger? Why don't we run to this grace, the grace that we can never merit? If we have been allowed to even pay for our sins, a single sin we've ever committed, we will never have been able to pay because there was no remission of sins. Grace has appeared unto us through Jesus Christ our Lord. In his blood we are sanctified. In his blood we are saved. By the Holy Spirit we are sanctified. And this all comes after we have come to him to receive the grace. The grace is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Anyone who believes is saved. And therefore, and he asks those people to his church of Christ that he purchased with his own blood. Will you be part of this journey? Will you be part of this grace? Just ask Habakkuk, promise of a grace of a remnant of the nation of Israel, not because of their works. So it's not because of our works we are saved today, but by the grace. However, we need to respond to this grace. We need to obey God who determines faith at any point in time so that the just will live by faith. The faith is Jesus Christ. Come quickly, come all, as time is taken by. For a time is coming, you cannot make a decision. The time that you are called out of this world or when he comes again. Churches of Christ all over the country invites you therefore to come and worship with us. Come and enjoy this grace. Come and have this unmerited favor that is in Christ Jesus only. God willing, next week we shall continue. Once again, this has been the Oracles of God radio broadcast, a biblical program that is run and sponsored by the Churches of Christ, which come your way every Wednesday, 5.30 a.m. Make a date with that same time. God willing, next week, as God continues to unravel his priceless oracles, you are warmly invited to worship with Churches of Christ all over the country, the pillar of truth, where an untreated word of God is shared and God is worshipped in spirit and in truth, you may want to contact us on 02455 27658 
or send us a message on coc.radio at yahoo.com. We're also located on Facebook at Church Radio, Church Radio. I am once again your brother, Eric Darko. Now may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify us through and through. May our own spirit, souls, and bodies be kept blameless at the appearance of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Till we meet again, stay rich and blessed. Amen and good morning.